Uh, as Richard said, uh, this talk's been scheduled for some time and uh, to cover the issues about the tendering of free and frank advice to ministers and the broader work around uh, integrity strategy for the state services that the Commission has been engaged in now for some months with a number of other government agencies. Uh, but clearly uh, the events of, of recent weeks uh, have given a context uh, to the issue of integrity of the public sector and I'd like to make a few remarks about those events uh, before I come to the, the uh, advertised theme. And obviously the two issues that I've got in front of my mind are firstly uh, issues uh, around uh, Roger Sutton's resignation as Chief Executive of SERA uh, and also uh, the issues raised in the Inspector General of Intelligence and Securities uh, report into the release of information uh, by the, the, the SIS. And if I can turn to that issue uh, firstly, um, uh, for those of you who, who haven't read Cheryl Gwynne's report, uh, I encourage you to read it. Uh, it is, I think, uh, a very thorough and thoughtful uh, piece of work which to me highlights the value of a strengthened uh, function uh, by the Inspector General. Uh, what I'd like to say about her findings is that first, uh, any adverse finding with respect to political neutrality uh, is simply unacceptable for any government agency and, and that is at the bedrock of the values uh, for us uh, as a public service. Uh, it's particularly disturbing finding I think for the uh, security intelligence service uh, because, because of the nature of the powers uh, that the parliament gives to that agency it is very important that there is respect for how the agency works that, that is broad across uh, the political spectrum. Uh, I'm very personally committed uh, to working with the Director of Security to assist her to implement uh, the Inspector General's recommendations fully uh, and as a matter of urgency. Um, in terms of Mr Sutton's resignation, that lies directly in my court and I'll say a number of things uh, about that. Uh, but first I make a general point that we can argue and have our opinions about such issues and how they are handled, uh, but what we can't disagree about is that there are institutions and processes in place to surface breaches and shortcomings, deal with them and learn from them as a system. And that ultimately for me is the test of the integrity of any system, that its institutions and processes are in place to bring to light uh, issues deal with them and then learn with them. Um, so I'm very much focused about what we have learnt and now need to do in the wake of the SERA case. And the three significant uh, criticisms uh, that have emerged about the handling of the case I want to deal with. Uh, two I believe are uh, misinformed, one I think has a, a matter of real substance to it. Uh, the first issue is that the investigation was not broad enough. Uh, what Sarah received and then passed to the Commission for investigation was a specific formal complaint from one complainant. Uh, there are clear pro processes to follow in such cases to ensure that all parties are properly and fairly treated. Uh, using a formal complaint around an employment situation of any kind to broaden out an investigation beyond that is not fair to either party. I'm completely confident that the investigation was properly and professionally carried out. Uh, indeed, the complaint was taken very seriously indeed from the minute it was received and reasonable measures were taken to protect both parties in the workplace while it was being investigated. The second criticism is that the Commission did not provide sufficient information in a timely manner to the media. Uh, the news media were alerted to the issue prior to the completion of the investigation and began asking questions while an employment investigation was still underway. I think any reasonable person would agree that withholding information or such an investigation is underway is the right thing to do. Similarly, it is reasonable and standard practice for confidentiality to apply to such investigations. In the event Mr Sutton's public comments clearly provoked someone unknown, perhaps understandably, to seek to redress the imbalance. I accept that that muddied the waters and there were calls for the full report of the investigation to be released. However, the fact of a breach does not release me from my own confidentiality 
and privacy obligations and it is my duty to honour that regardless. That takes me to the third, in my view, the most substantive criticism that in holding a joint press conference with Mr Sutton, I gave him a public voice that the complainant did not have and a platform to trivialise the events that triggered his resignation. And that in so doing, I effectively showed that I, and by implication, the public service do not take unacceptable behaviour towards female public servants seriously enough. And further, that the impact means complainants will be less confident to come forward. I accept that the way the press conference transpired left room for all the opinions and views and criticisms that subsequently flowed. I accept that it was distressing for the complainant and I wrote to the complainant a few days later about the events that week and apologised to her for my share of responsibility uh, about those outcomes. Holding a press conference with Mr Sutton was a mistake. I accept full responsibility for that mistake and deeply regret the hurt uh, that arose uh, from it. We can debate how that happened, uh, it was what it was and it was a mistake. What I am now focused on is what we have learnt from this issue and what we need to do as a result of that. Uh, because I think, um, and certainly before the events of the press conference, I was left with the sense that we weren't solely dealing with uh, an issue that was particular uh, to that chief executive and staff member within that organisation, but there were a set of questions that this matter raised with me about our system more broadly. As a first measure, I have written to agency chief executives reminding them of their legal obligations as good employers, their responsibility to have appropriate processes in place to respond to complaints and to highlight the guidance that is already available. This includes guidance on creating a positive work environment on the Commission's website and the comprehensive guidance on bullying released by MB and WorkSafe New Zealand in February, preventing and responding to workplace bullying, which is on both of their websites. What this issue has raised in the public discussion that has followed is that there are different understandings around harassment and what constitutes inappropriate behaviour. Clearly we need to get a much more common understanding so that our workplaces are safe for all staff within them. There is variation between different agencies, policies and practices about how we deal with these matters. Um, my aim is to make sure that we have a standard policy and process on harassment and bullying for the state services as a whole in place by the end of April 2015. Chief executives are, are accountable for ensuring that policies on appropriate conduct are built into induction courses and training systems. This is a really important point. Every year, 8,500 people are hired by the public service alone. Uh, they will come from a variety of backgrounds, some from other public service agencies, others from beyond uh, the public sector. Uh, regardless about where people come to, into an agency, it's really important uh, that from the start we are very clear mm -hmm. about what are the appropriate standards of behaviour uh, for all staff. We're also looking at the approach that should be used to clarify and reinforce the standards of professional behaviour <coughs> expected of chief executives and other senior leaders in organisations. And this includes considering how best to fairly and objectively assess allegations of misconduct. On a broader front, I've asked for a working group of experts from public sector agencies and the PSA to advise on how we might get on the front foot in creating productive workplaces where all individuals are valued and feel safe. And we need to track and monitor progress towards this. The Ministry for Women will have a lead role in this work, working with the Commission, and I'm also bringing together a reference group to provide feedback at key stages and I've asked the Equal Employment Opportunity Commissioner, Dr Jackie Blue, to be involved. The message for leaders in the state services is that consistent high levels of professional behaviour are expected. Lapses from those standards will continue to be dealt with proportionately. However, Mr Sutton's resignation signals that expectations are high and I have little tolerance for them not being met. I'm confident that the measures that we'll be collectively putting in place mean the mistakes made and lessons learned from recent experience will strengthen 
the system. Uh, <clears throat> one lesson to, to emerge from the Sarah case is that everyone who has knowledge of any individual employment matter needs to understand that when a private complaint is being dealt with through those processes, it is best left at that. When selective information is revealed to carry out the dispute in public, all parties end up getting hurt and in the process the integrity of the system designed to resolve such issues is eroded. <laughs> I began this talk by saying uh, that acknowledging and dealing with errors to improve the system is a critical part of maintaining those standards. We strive for perfection and at times fall short, but we do so from a position of setting high standards of integrity and expectations, and for the most part, we, myth, we meet them. That doesn't mean that errors are good, because it is through errors that we improve the situation. Ideally, our system would be improved without errors. Any error is regrettable, but the greater harm is not to learn from it. However, we need to restore some perspective and remind ourselves that in general, we are seeking to improve from a relatively a good position. In terms of the overall integrity of New Zealand's public institutions and government system, there is much to be proud of and good evidence for that. In 2014, New Zealand ranked second of 175 countries in Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index, first in the International Budget Partnerships Biennial Open Budget Survey, first of 132 countries in the 2013 Social Progress Index third of 183 economies on the World Bank's assessment of how governments regulate commerce, fourth of 77 countries in the Global Open Data Barometer, and in the top 10 in the World Justice Project's Rule of Law Index. Yesterday, the most recent Kiwis Count uh, survey results were released. This survey regularly asks New Zealanders about the extent to which they trust uh, the public service. Uh, since we started the survey, in 2007, uh, the perception of trust has increased markedly. So in 2007, only 29% of New Zealanders uh, had a high trust generally in the public service. Today that's 45%. In 2007, 22% of New Zealanders had very low trust in the public sector. 14% uh, think that today. I think that is a great achievement to public servants working right throughout New Zealand, who have been delivering great services through some quite tough times in New Zealand and I think that's a, that's a result that we want to build on but we should also um, celebrate as, as public servants. And one of the reasons that New Zealand maintains pride in legislation, there are various strategies around transparency, data use and corruption. Uh, we have a series of institutions uh, through government that deal uh, with citizens and their concerns about uh, the operation of the state or state uh, agencies. Uh, however, uh, I'm very committed that we uh, don't be complacent about our good standing. Uh, and that is why uh, last year, uh, when Transparency International uh, brought out uh, its Integrity System Assessment Report, uh, I was very keen uh, that we took that excellent uh, piece of work uh, and then turned it into uh, a strategy uh, for uh, New Zealand, for New Zealand State Services. And over the last few months, uh, we've had a series of engagements with uh, a wide number of government agencies and people beyond government uh, that I expect will come together uh, in, in the new year. And I think that strategy will do a couple of things. Uh, firstly, I think it will continue for us to point to uh, issues that are enduring and we need to keep focus on. And one of those, for example, uh, is the ability of uh, state servants to both exercise their civil and political uh, liber liberties at the same time as recognising their uh, professional obligations as public servants. And we also have a rapidly changing uh, society. And that's most evident uh, in Auckland, but not exclusively. To Auckland. Uh, we're increasingly moving into a society of increasing cultural and economic diversity. Uh, those are conditions that have the potential to disp disturb the participation of citizens in civic life. For example, we have growing immigrant populations that come from jurisdictions where government is assumed to be corrupt. 
they have an understandable distrust of government at all levels and a consequent reluctance to work in public service, whether that is at elected levels or at an appointed position. We have a job to do to build their trust in our civic institutions if we are to be a truly inclusive multicultural society. That means a society where the integrity of all our cultural communities is celebrated and where the makeup of our public services and participation in civic life uh, benefits uh, at, as, a, as a result. And I'm hopeful that uh, by having for the first time a strategy for integrity uh, that is clear across the state services and within which uh, particular agencies have their own uh, distinct leadership roles but within the context of a connected program that we can keep the momentum going about maintaining uh, the high levels of trust and confidence which I think are really important not only for us as public servants serving the people of New Zealand uh, but also to maintain New Zealand's high standing uh, in the world uh, as a as a vibrant uh, democratic society uh, that uh, speaks, <coughs> speaks well in a number of forums. I now want to turn to what used to be called the convention of the public sector providing free and frank advice to government. And I say used to because last year Parliament recognised the importance of the convention and amended the State Sector Act to strengthen the responsibility of chief executives. They are now required explicitly to steward the capability and capacity of the departments to offer free and frank advice to ministers of successive governments. So it is no longer just a convention or a practice, uh, but a legislative uh, obligation. Uh, free and frank advice uh, is a hot topic in parts of the public service, and there is a well re rehearsed view that in the last 20 years or so, free and frank advice has given way to public servants tailoring advice to what ministers want to hear or anticipating what they think ministers uh, want to hear. We should not dismiss lightly the perception of some very knowledgeable critics that the system has lost the robustness it once had. What I'd like to do today uh, is, is to argue uh, a little bit about well, what does free and frank advice mean, but I think I'd like to help, to, my contribution today is to reframe the debate about the policy function. Because it seems to me that at the heart of the criticism of departments uh, in terms of offering advice to ministers, uh, there's implicitly a criticism that the policy function uh, is not as effective as it could be and needs to be to make a difference for New Zealanders. Uh, fundamentally, I have similar concerns. I may differ in terms of uh, what needs to change and the, and the balance of emphasis, uh, but I think um, I'd like to reframe, reframe the free and frank debate as being one between people who have a problem with the policy function and people who are perceived uh, perhaps to be complacent about the nature of the policy function. If I can turn to free and frank advice, firstly, uh, for me it's not something that sits in splendid and unqualified isolation. What New Zealanders need from their public servants is free, frank and effective advice not free, frank and fruitless advice. Free and frank advice is coupled with making wise judgments to ensure the advice is effective. The context in which free and frank advice is given is set out in the Cabinet Manual. The manual states that ministers are ultimately responsible for setting the government's policy priorities and objectives. The role of chief executives in their agencies is to provide all relevant information to enable ministers to set these priorities and objectives. Officials are required to perform their jobs professionally without bias towards one political party or another. They are also expected to act in such a way as the agency maintains the confidence of its current minister and future minister. That means not just making judgments about the substance of the advice given, but also when and how it is most effectively <coughs> delivered it is a matter of both substance and style. Chief executives and policy managers are making ongoing judgments about how to deploy limited policy resources across their department's work program. That is their job. Those judgments will not always accord with the preferences of individual staff who will argue the merits of a different work program. And I'll come to a point that I think in some ways as a system, 
uh, there are elements of our prioritisation around offering policy advice uh, that we need to change. Advice given to ministers must be honest, it must be impartial, it must be comprehensive. It must also reflect the, pr the priorities determined by the government of the day. During the policy process, the advice given by officials should be free and frank. The clear context is that the primary responsibility of officials is to help ministers achieve their priorities and objectives. The political neutrality and impartiality of public servants is designed to create a system that can serve the government of the day. Um, this is in stark contrast to some of the commentary being made. At a recent conference of public servants, a group of our up-and-coming young professionals was given advice about uh, why ministers may not want to hear policy options that officials think are effective, durable, cost-effective, practical. They may not want to hear it because it does not align with their politics or ideology before they have discounted it publicly. The clear implication was officials should dish it up regardless. Put this into a current context. The current Prime Minister has made it clear over three elections that the current government will not raise the age of entitlement for New Zealand's superannuation. He has pledged on several occasions to keep existing <coughs> benefits while he is in office. National's election policy stated keep the eligibility age for super at 65. And the government has also received a wave of advice previously from domestic and international experts that it needs to le le lift the age of entitlement for superannuation. There is no shortage of policy advice on that matter. Public servants are not in the business of wasting taxpayers' money developing advice that is particularly free, frank and fruitless. That is no way to retain the confidence of the Minister or indeed to effectively guide and influence uh, the government of the day around the really important issues uh, that are in front of it. And the public servant's job is to provide advice that will allow the government to retain its policy integrity while at the same time offsetting any adverse impacts of it. <coughs> Therefore, if you look at, for example, the Treasury's uh, 2014 briefing to the incoming administration, uh, there is no reference to uh, lifting the age of entitlement for superannuation. Now, there's a lot of other advice about uh, the incoming administration's policy priorities, and I believe that that was an entirely appropriate uh, set of judgments for the Treasury uh, management to make. Adopting a gladiatorial approach in which public servants pit themselves against ministers and fearless displays of discounted advice uh, may indulge an official's ego and sense of independence, but it does little for New Zealanders. All it does is erode the trust relationship between ministers and public servants that are central to delivering effective policies and services for us all. Clearly there are times where the evidence weighs heavily against the government's committed direction. Public servants do have a professional responsibility to ensure that responsible ministers know that, but that does not absolve them from also engaging in a way through that. Political neutrality is not a licence to offer advice in a vacuum. Another piece of, it, of context that gets confused with the delivery of free and frank advice is the public services behaviour following the introduction of the Official Information Act in the early 1980s. Now, there is an issue to be thought through around the careful crafting of disclosed advice and manipulation of processes around its release. That issue is currently the subject of an inquiry by the Chief Ombudsman and I look forward to her report on that matter. But it is drawing a long bow to conclude from that, as some do, that free and frank advice given away from the public eye is increasingly less blunt, couched in soft messages and crafted in a way that is palatable for party politics. And a longer bow still to conclude that public servants are being compliant to their political masters as a matter of course. <coughs> the convention of free and frank advice developed in an era where delivering it away from the public eye was a default position. I'm exposed to many places away from the public eye where I give or listen to exchanges between ministers and senior officials. And my consistent experience is that as a matter of course, the discussion is robust and free and frank. That is not an argument against public disclosure, but the increasing demand for transparency clearly has made officials more cautious when providing advice that is open. Finally on this topic, and to add some perspective, I want to refer to the Nielsen survey on integrity and conduct that was carried out for the Commission 
last year. This provides a picture of where the system think, itself thinks things are at. The survey results show that 84% of senior leaders and managers consider that senior leaders routinely provide robust, politically neutral advice to ministers, and in the public service departments, 96% had that confidence. That is the level where ministers and public servants regularly interface, and therefore where asserting political neutrality is most important. On a wider front, 67% of the staff surveyed across 42 public service departments and crown entities agree that the political views of people in my agency do not interfere with how they do their job. In the public service departments, that rose to 75%. As I said at the start, none of this is to say that the policy function is perfect or that it can be improved. This is clear from reports in recent years, and I refer to the Scott Review on Policy Expenditure in 2010 and Sir Peter Gluckman's report in 2013 on the role of evidence in policy formation and implementation. I'd also refer to the system findings that were published by the Commission around uh, various performance improvement framework reports that have been prepared over the past five years. And collectively, these reports uh, point to the need for the policy function uh, to become more effective and in some particularly important ways. Firstly, the reports uh, point to the need for a longer term focus and for more joined up advice across government agencies around some of the really hard and tractable issues that New Zealand faces over the next 10 or 20 years, whether that's in an economic, social, environmental or security uh, domain. Um, the Scott Review in particular uh, referred to uh, variability in the quality of policy shops and the need for much stronger use of evidence and evaluation. And that is why, for example, I have been keen to promote Sir Peter Gluckman's recommendations on the appointment of a network of chief science advisors in relevant areas. In addition, recently I've asked the Chief Executive of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, in conjunction with the Chief Executives of the large policy shops across the public service, to drive much stronger leadership, much more coordination, and much more clarity around professional standards and development across the policy function. Nevertheless, the current debate is good in that it challenges any sense of complacency that I don't believe uh, is, is warranted. It forces us to look anew, not just at the responsibility to provide free and frank advice, but the integrity of our public institutions and systems generally. The state sector reform program that we're currently in engaged in incorporates these change and challenges. It's aimed at delivering greater and more value to citizens more efficiently. It's around reforming the system to be truly citizen-centered and collectively responsible around issues that are intruding on New Zealand, being an inclusive society where the well-being of all cultures and individuals is secure. That is a major system integrity issue and a challenge we must meet if public services are to remain relevant to all citizens. Thank you.